Top Bed Talk. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor William Harrant Griffiths. William has been a colleague of mine on College Council. In fact, you followed me as Vice President. Yeah. Yep. Probably did a better job. <laughs> um, uh, William is a consultant anaesthetist, uh, I suspect well known to many of you, but uh, a consultant anaesthetist at St Mary's. Uh, who specialises in all the bits of anaesthesia that I wasn't very good at and didn't focus on like obstetrics and local blocks. A clinical professor at Imperial. He is a military honorary advisor, civilian advisor to the military. Correct. And has a very long list of previous incarnations, <laughs> senior appointments in anaesthesia, including being, as you will recall, president of the Association of Anaesthetists, editing the journal. His bio is worth a read. Uh, he's a little bit of an enigma because he claims that his lectures are a triumph of style over substance, but actually I've been to quite a few of them and they're, they're very stylish, but there's, there's, there's a content. lot of substance <laughs> as well, I'm afraid, so I'm not hey, sure that, your claim is substantiated. That's very kind. So, real pleasure, William is going to talk today, I think, about anaesthesia associates. The future of the anaesthetic workforce in the UK, the which is mainly about anaesthesia associates, but I didn't want to say that up front in case nobody turned up. Um, and we sometimes have questions, we sometimes don't have questions after plenaries, but, but I think a discussion would be Fantastic. welcome. Thank you, William. Mike, thank you very much indeed. A and thank you very much indeed for inviting me. Uh, so that's the title of the talk, The Future of the Anaesthetic Workforce in the UK, A Personal View. If anybody wants a copy of the presentation, you are welcome to email me personally at willhg at pm.me. Repeating interest, Mike's done my work for me, uh, for the most part. Uh, I am Professor of Practice in Imperial. I give anaesthetics for a living at St Mary's Hospital. Uh, I'm Vice President for another seven and a half weeks of the Royal College of Anaesthetists. Uh, I advise the British Army on anaesthesia, and I'm old, grumpy, opinionated, and soon to be released from the constraints of high office. So I can pretty much say whatever I want to right now. Uh, this, this proves I'm old. This is 40 years almost to the day ago. This is me, believe it or not, as an anaesthetic SHO at uh, St. Thomas's Hospital, just south of the river. So that proves how old I am. Um, you're probably expecting EBPOM, uh, and I, I don't make any apologies for subverting EBPOM uh, and making it just briefly OBPOM, because this is, this is mostly opinion. There is a little bit of information tucked in, but it's my opinion, and after I've spoken, I very much want your opinion on what's going on. The opinions I'm expressed are not necessarily those of the organizations with which I have the honor to be associated, and some of them are definitely not the opinions of the organizations with which I'm associated. So please don't say the college thinks when the reality is that William Harrop Griffiths thinks. Overview. Uh, we need more anaesthetists. You're not going to disagree with me, but I'll just outline how many more anaesthetists I think that we need. I'm going to ask the key question, which is, do they have to be anaesthetists as we would recognize anaesthetists, people who go to medical school, spend very many years in training before they're actually released out into the wild on their own, or can they be something different and still provide safe care? Uh, this is a cry that Mike and I and others hear, of, what's the college going to do? There's a pandemic. What's the college going to do about it? The cost of living is going to the? I'll calm down. But what's the college going to do about this in particular? Our members do say that quite a lot. Some current issues, I'm not going to call them problems with anaesthesia associates, uh, whether we can learn anything from the experience in the United States of America. And just for two slides tucked in at the end, some philosophical stuff about what is a doctor? What does a doctor do? What, what makes a doctor a doctor? Houston, we have a problem. The NHS has a problem. We have too many patients. We have too little money. We have too few anaesthetists. These are the April 22 figures for incomplete referral to treatment pathways. And the headline figure you've probably seen already is six and a half million people are waiting for their pathway to be completed. And many of these are expecting surgery. These are the surgical specialities within those and enlarging and expanding. You'll see that the numbers are chunky. These are big numbers of people waiting and that a lot of them are waiting for surgery and anaesthetists are of course involved in the delivery of those surgical services. This simply reminds me to say that all those data are on England and are not on the devolved NHSs. They also have waiting lists. The absolute numbers are not as large, but the proportions of their population are approximately similar. Wales is slightly higher proportion of their population than England. So it's not just an England problem, but England is where the big numbers are. 
This is a fascinating uh, image I managed to find. Th this is the waiting list since the inception of the National Health Service in 1949, all the way through to the current day. Where you see a big jump up associated with a change in colour, that's a change of the basis of the calculation. So they started out with inpatient waiting lists, then it was inpatient outpatient surgery, then they included outpatient treatment, then it became 18 week targets. But the nub of it is two things to draw from this. One interesting thing is that the only times that the numbers have gone down steeply were the Blair government there and the Brown government there. That's not a political comment at all, particularly not under the current circumstances. But the only time you can see it go down significantly is when those two Labour governments threw a hell of a lot of money, a really serious amount of money at it. The other important point to note is that the number of people waiting for treatment was well on the way up, even before the pandemic, signified by that little dip and the whoosh afterwards, even before it started. We had over four million people in England waiting for stuff to happen, even before coronavirus was thought about. So this is a growing problem, it's accelerating fast, but it is a problem, it is a systemic problem within the NHS that we have had for some considerable time. And the problem is only going to get bigger. And this is an article published within the last couple of weeks in the Sunday Times. Uh, Sean Linton, the excellent health, edit health editor of the Sunday Times, based on some work done by a Birmingham academic group who essentially got some calculators and a little bit of imagination and produced some quite startling figures. And this is what they say. Without a substantial increase in NHS capacity, the team behind the work say that the total figure waiting for surgery could rise to 14.6 million people, or more than one in four people of the population of England could be waiting for some procedure or for surgery. Eliminating that would require a 50% increase in activity across the NHS based on pre-pandemic performance and require 9.2 billion pounds or £163 per person in England. Those are very eye-catching numbers. And I think that they are, that they, it's not imagination, they've done their maths, but that may be an extreme view perhaps to attract attention. But what it basically says is these numbers are going to rise and rise and rise unless something is done about it. Now, one thing you can do about it is you can, as Blair and Brown did, throw money at it. The problem is there's no money. It, it's gone, basically, or it's all but gone. There are loads of slides you can find that basically say that the UK is in dire financial straits. This is one of the ones that I was actually able to understand. And if you look, that hundred there is the national debt expressed as GDP in percent. So when it goes up to 100, it shows the amount of money you owe is equal to your gross domestic product. This apparently, according to economists, is not a very good thing at all. And this is over the last, since 1974, five, and it bumps around between 25 and 50%. Suddenly, financial crisis 2008, it goes up to 80%, and it doesn't go down at all. And then COVID comes blat and kicks it out. There. Exactly the same message, the same story as those waiting lists. There was a problem happening anyway, and this has made that problem even worse. But there's not much money lying around at all. And I, as, as part of my role as vice president, I'm very fortunate to be party to some confidential online meetings. And I was at a confidential online meeting, and this is the exchange that happened. Th this is a Royal College president whom I won't name, but was actually Catherine Henderson, the president of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, who I think is utterly brilliant and speaks fantastically. And what she essentially said was this, the health and social care system in this country is broken. And one of the consequences is that we cannot get patients out of the hospital. If you cannot get patients out of the hospital, you cannot get patients into the hospital, which means that emergency medicine departments and ambulance services are in absolute crisis. Something must be done. I, she spoke absolutely. There was, there was, at the meeting, there was this terribly, terribly senior member of the NHS. I won't mention his name, but I called him Chris. That's all I'm saying. All I'm saying. This is nothing to do with it, but it's a lovely quote that you realise the truth of. Most doctors know about as much about social care as politicians know about medicine. So unless you're a geriatrician, a GP, 
or an A&E doc don't claim you know things about social care because statistically the chances are certainly anaesthetists we don't know anything about social care but essentially what he then said was the treasury gave you everything it could during the pandemic there just isn't any money left and there's no point in asking for more money you have to go for transformation transformation one of the zeitgeist words of the moment we will change everything and we'll be able to do it within the same financial envelope so this is all about transformation but you must remember that transformation is not just about workforce workforce is part of the transformation that our masters think we can undergo in order to address the problem that we have of a substantially increasing number of patients and without the capacity to actually do anything about it so this is one bit of transformation that i'm sure you all will have heard about getting it right first time or GERFT, and their creation of surgical hubs where they will have HVLC work going on, high volume, low complexity work. And I think it's proving quite successful. The leadership of GERFT is an interesting chap. You've met him, an ebullient orthopedic surgeon, Tim Briggs. He, he is an irresistible force, but the NHS waiting list is an immovable object. And I support almost all of what he does. And he's creating these surgical hubs throughout the country. And the Royal College of Anesthetists and anesthetists in general are participating and cooperating. And it looks like they may help towards this problem, but they won't be the solution to the problem. But I'm going to focus much more on workforce transformation and ask the ultimate question, which is, can we get better value out of the anaesthetic workforce by changing it, by transforming it without in any way, shape or form compromising patient safety? Because when it comes down to it, it is all about safety before numbers and we would not want to accept anything that does not provide acceptable patient safety. Hopefully you will have read this wonderful document produced by the policy unit of the Royal College of Anesthetists based on surveys and work done in late 20, early 21 and published in February 22 called the UK State of the Nation Report on the Anesthetic Workforce. If you haven't read it, I would strongly encourage you this evening to go and click onto the college's website, rcoa.ac.uk, download it and have a good read. It'll help you nod off this evening. So I shall show you the headlines here broken down into the four countries of the United Kingdom. The first line is the actual number of consultant anaesthetists at the moment, snapshot at the moment, 8,000 is the bottom line. And the next line down is the number of unfilled consultant posts. That's essentially 1,050. Next line down is SAS doctors, that's 2,000. And it kind of surprised me when I first saw it that SAS doctors are 20% of the overall workforce who are not trainees, because it doesn't feel like that in some parts of London, uh, but it is nationally. And then the number of unfilled SAS uh, trust posts, and that's around 350. So you come down to a headline number of the shortage of anesthesia providers, kind of right now, but actually really last year, of 1,400. But the problem is not simply numeric. We are getting old and we are dropping off, some more than others. Because um, if you look at these epochs of the 30 to 39 year old, 40 to 49, 50 to 59 and over 60, we have an aging workforce. Yet the number of younger people getting smaller, the number of older people getting bigger. And it seems that for the most part, once you hit 60 as an anaesthetist, you're out of there. You're gone. People are not, not many people are staying on beyond the age of 60 in order to continue contributing towards the NHS. It is quite a serious problem. Now this is where people get hold of their calculators and a little bit of imagination and then say that if the need for anaesthetists continue to increase at its current rate over the next 20 years, what's going to happen? If the supply of anaesthesia providers continues at the same rate, what's going to happen? And how many short are you going to be at the end? And the answer is 11,000 anaesthetists. Yes, it's probably an exaggeration, but it's an eye-catching number and it's a big number and it is a real problem that we are short of anaesthetists. This has even got to the Financial Times, admittedly an article written by an anaesthetic trainee, but this has penetrated the Financial Times as something that may be of importance. The shortage of anaesthetists endangers the recovery of the NHS. So now I want you to think, solutions to the shortage. Okay, you, there you are, you're in charge of policy for the National Health Service, and you've got to solve this workforce crisis in NHS. Lots of other specialities have workforce crises as well, but for obvious, obvious reasons, I'm going to focus on this one. Hold on to the older anaesthetists that we have. 
that this is an, th there is a big drive from the NHS, and I've been involved in some of their work, how can we stop 60-year-olds retiring? If I were a cynical man, and let me assure you that I'm not a cynical man, if I were a cynical man, I would say that what you do is steadily degrade the pension until you'll bloody well have to carry on working beyond the age of 60 because you won't be able to afford to buy food if you don't. But I wouldn't say that and I would not want that sort of sentiment ascribed to me. Play, throw money at it? Well, do you know what? We, we ask people what's important to them. We've asked anaesthetists what's important to them. It's not money. Money's in there. But it's not the top, second or third of the list. We actually, we actually like nice working conditions. We, do, we like a flexible job plan. So what happens too much in this country is that the 59 and 3 quarters year old goes up to their clinical leader and said, I'm hitting 60 in three months time. I'd really like to get rid of this on-call stuff. And then the clinical leader says, we have no use for a consultant who's not on-call. Thank you very much. You can retire which is crazy because you lose that person. Not only are they very experienced, but they tend to be quite quick as well. They might be messy, but they're quite quick in the operating theater and they get through cases. You don't want to lose that. So the NHS genuinely is trying to say to trusts, be more flexible, provide good working conditions, accept the fact that that person is aging and change their job plan. And maybe a little bit of more money, but it's not the money that's going to make the difference. Get retired and easy to come back to work. This is fantastic. Um, one of the senior NHS people uh, was a surgeon, uh, was in fact a colorectal surgeon. And during the height of the pandemic, the meeting, this person, they said, fantastic, we found 245 retired anesthetists who are prepared to come back to work. And I said, you do realize that that's less than 1% of the workforce. Said, really? It sounded like a big number to me. Well, it's a lot of colorectal surgeons. It's not actually a lot of anesthetists. So, and, but we can make them come back to work. I said, well, the problem is that what you cannot do is if they are a car, not many people want to come back to work after two years away from anesthesia. It's not that sort of job. If you're a dermatologist, no, I won't knock dermatologists. That would be very unfair. But rashes don't change very much. Do they? The treatment doesn't change. It's all coal tar or steroids. It's nothing else. Where was I? I get my thread back again. <laughs> You can't take a cardiac anesthetist who's been out of it for, for two years and say, come back and do a whole week cardiac. You can't make them go back to those things. You've got to give them different things to do. The other problem is anesthetists retire to Hampshire and Dorset and Cornwall, which is not where the population centres are. And who's going to come back from their thatched cottage in Cornwall and work in a large central England conurbation that I won't mention because it'll offend some of you. It's difficult getting retired people back. This was another great one. The, the GERF leader, who, whose name I mentioned, at one point said, well, I, I think I've got the solution. Uh, get other people to give the anaesthetics. I mean, how hard can it be? Uh, this was after he had seen anaesthetists become amateur intensivists after about a week's update. And he thought, we can do that for anaesthesia. It's much simpler than intensive care. And of course, he was shouted down and I ridiculed him and continue to ridicule him. But there's something there, isn't there? You can't completely dismiss that. Is it imaginable that with the correct amount of training you could have people who'd be trained for a shorter time and are cheaper to give some of the simpler things. Is our workforce model too rigid? Roll back 40 years. This is my view of what the workforce model was in 40 years ago. Basically there are doctor things, there are nurse things, and there are ODA things, I'm probably department assistant for any of you who are older, as old as I am. And these are very, very different things. You, you can't cross the barriers. You can't cross the boundaries. And actually giving a general anaesthetic is definitely, definitely a doctor thing. And, and that's basically our workforce model. And, and that was the workforce model. So roll forward 20 years and the now luxuriously mustachioed Harriet Griffiths achieves election to the Council of the Association of Anaesthetists and the, one of the things we were discussing was exactly this. But even then the workforce model was as follows. There are doctor things, there are nurse things, there are now ODP things and they go very different things. Uh, and giving an anaesthetic is definitely, definitely a doctor thing or well, almost always a doctor thing and that's about it. So that we would just start to talk about anaesthetic practitioners 20 years ago when I joined the Council of the Association of Anaesthetists. Here I am looking rather old and jowly and no longer with a moustache in 2022. Things are changing and we say, well, actually, there might just be a few 
sort of different ways of, of doing this. Uh, why divide clinical activities into doctor things, nurse things, ODP things, and non-doctor, non-nurse, not ODP things, when actually, if there's a thing to do, what you need is the person with the knowledge, skills, experience, capability, and whatever attributes in order to do the thing. And it doesn't matter at all whether they're called doctor or nurse or ODP. The titles actually mean nothing to the safety and efficacy of the procedure, and probably not a great deal to the patient either. So what I will argue to you is that I think now is the time to question the traditional and rigid workforce model. We're looking at changes happening right across medicine at the moment. Things are moving. We are seeing the growth and emergence of medical associate professions. You will may already have worked with physician associates, with advanced critical care practitioners, with surgical care practitioners, and now with the main points of my talk, which is anesthesia associates. There are very many of these MAPs overall. But if you take it and you say, what are the key stakeholders in this process? What do they really, really want? What do they, what do they actually want? What do the patients want? What do anaesthetists want? And what does the NHS want? There are lots of other stakeholders as well. <laughs> what do they want? Well, I would argue that patients want their anaesthesia services delivered safely by competent and knowledgeable people. You are welcome to stand up and say, oi, they want doctors to give them their anaesthetics. But you and I know that most patients are blithely unaware of whether we're doctors or not. And that's probably our fault for not informing them or the surgeon's fault for not telling them. They, they shouldn't really mind what the title of the person is as long as they're competent to do it. This is what anaesthetists want. I've just mentioned this. This is not just old anaesthetists want, but even younger anaesthetists and even young anaesthetists want this as well. We want good working conditions. We want flexible job plans when we need flexible job plans. We want some sort of recognition. We want people to understand what we do, why we do it, and to say well done when we actually do it right, which is precious little of in the NHS at the moment. And at the end, we want a decent reward for the work that we put in and for the training that we've had. What does the NHS want? The NHS wants an abundant supply of good value competent anaesthesia providers because it just does, okay? Because it's looking at the bottom line, the money. And that's what it wants them to be good and it wants lots of them and it wants them to provide anaesthesia. Now back in the day, and I promise you this is the last picture of me looking like a callow, handsome youth, that was me. The trainees were abundant. There were loads of us. And each stage of our career, there were fewer. It was like a pyramid. People dropped out at the end of SHO, registrar and senior registrar, because of the pyramidal structure of training. Because we're kind of disposable. You know, if you didn't, couldn't get on, you couldn't get on. It's a tough life. Go and do another speciality. We were good value because we were paid naff all. I got £9,000 for a year as an SHO. And even taking inflation into account, that's only about 30 grand these days. We were relatively un underpaid. And we were competent because we worked endless hours. Because we were always at the hospital, always giving anaesthetics. We became very quickly very, com very competent. And it was fantastic. Look, we could do all these cases. The consultants barely had to turn up. And in St. Thomas's Hospital in those days, they didn't turn up. They were busy elsewhere. Then this guy happened to us. I'll be impressed if any of you... Oh, there's Mythen's nodding wisely. And I won't ask him who it is. But it's Cal Ken Calman, Sir Kenneth Calman. And he said some really radical things. He said, don't abuse trainees. Train them. What? And, and have run through training so you don't get wastage of people who've put half their professional life into something and then get spat out by the system. Don't overwork them. What? This was incredible. But he was right, and so we had calmanization. There's a problem that all of a sudden these abundant, dirt cheap, competent trainees were changing subtly, not to be as any of the three, the three of them are taking longer to train. So now we've got consultants. The consultants are competent, brilliantly competent. We turn out wonderful consultants. They're not terribly good value because they're at the top of the tree when it comes to medical pay, so they do cost quite a lot. And as I've just hopefully pointed out, they're not terribly abundant either. Pay scales. Trainee pay scale is the hardest because there's lots of factors that affect how much they get and some may get more than that. Not many are going to get less than that. At the bottom is anaesthesia associate and what draws the eye to start off with, and they're on band 7 or 8A of Agenda for Change, is that there's quite a lot of overlap between anaesthesia associate, trainee and SAS. 
and there is quite a lot of uh, overlap and that causes quite a lot of disquiet. People say it's an awful lot of money but band 7 and band 8A of Agenda for Change is where they settle. But consultants right at the top and that's before they get any sort of local clinical excellence awards, national clinical impact awards, additional management payments or anything like that. But you've also got to remember that although the thing you are instantly have your eye drawn towards is the person's salary, the cost to the NHS is not just salary. Anaesthetists need training and consultants take an awful long time to train. We are five years at medical school, two foundation years, three core training years, four specialist training years. That's 14 years as a minimum from when I first stepped my foot into Oxford University Medical School to when I actually became a substantive consultant anaesthetist was 16 years. And in those days, that was considered really rather quick. Or are you sure he's grown up in? It, was, it, it is a very long time, even now it takes, at least. So SAS doctors, pretty long time as well. Five years at medical school, two years foundation training and then at least four years postgraduate training after that, which is quite a few years as well. Let's turn now to anaesthesia associates. We hope that most of the anaesthesia associates will come from science degree backgrounds, okay? We don't want to deplete too many of the ODPs, anaesthetic nurses and other uh, already uh, people already employed by the NHS. The great news is that we don't have to pay for the science degree, that's all done by somebody else. The NHS doesn't pay for it. What we pay for effectively is a two years, three month master's course, which means that the amount of time it takes to turn somebody into an anaesthesia associate is two years, three months. I am not saying that there is an equivalence between a consultant anaesthetist, an SAS doctor and an anaesthesia associate at the end of training. There are huge differences in knowledge, skills, experience, capability. But if you can produce part of the workforce that could help you with a large proportion of those people waiting who are ASA 1 or 2, who are undergoing minor or intermediate procedures, is it not wise not to use the most expensive people that you employ, but some of the less expensive people that you employ? It makes, to my mind, fundamental sense. So I think now is a time for a bigger workforce, and I'm going to use the B word, now is time for a blended workforce, which just means a bit more varied, chucking another couple of groups of people into it. But blended is a really good word because it sounds cool. Blended teaching, it's really popular at the moment. In which this workforce, you match the task to the capability. You don't overplay the capability to the task. You make sure that they've got the capability for the task, that there is appropriate supervision and backup, but that you don't overqualify people to do really. When I took my pension in 2019, I was the best paid consultant in the anaesthetic department. I did mostly gynae lists. It doesn't make financial sense. I loved it. Don't get me wrong. It's fantastic. Very relaxing and good fun. Nice for the patients. Nice people to work with. But financially, that doesn't make any sense at all. Patient safety in this context would be supported by supervision. Do not think if you're a trainee that, you, that your, your chances of being employed at the end are in any way going to be affected by the growth of anaesthesia associates in the next few years because there's room for more of everything, more consultants, more SAS doctors, more trainees, more anaesthesia associates because we are so short of anaesthesia providers in the UK. That gives you greater capacity, gives you greater flexibility, in theory it gives you greater efficiency and in theory, and I accept in theory, every bit is safe providing we do it absolutely right. I don't need to tell you that anaesthetists don't just give anaesthetics and up on that screen now is a few of the other things that, w that we do and I'm going to call your attention just to two of them, sedation and transfer. A lot of patients get sedated in dangerous circumstances by people who are not trained properly to rescue from the consequences of moderate and deep sedation down in the x-ray department, down in the cardiology department, deep down in the bowels of the endoscopy department. Meanwhile, a lot of people who receive sedation in the operating theatre receive sedation from people who've been in the business for 40 years when they don't need to. There's a, dis there's a disparity and a mismatch in the provision of capability for a lot of people undergoing sedation. And it's true for transfer as well. You know yourself, if you work in an anaesthetic department, that the only person available to take the transfer to the hospital 30 miles away is the ST6 that you desperately need, when the only reason you're sending the ST6 is because the physicians are too frightened, the patient's not intubated, you just have to sit there for an et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You could have somebody trained in transfer who could, if necessary, control and maintain that airway if needs be, but isn't the highly valuable, highly trained ST6 or consultant anaesthetist. 
Okay, Look, a quick slurp of water, then I'll tell you what the, new, what the Royal College of Venice is going to do about it. We are not working on our own. We are working with other people. We're working very closely with the General Medical Council and Health Education England. Other health education organisations are available, and we work with the ones in Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland as well. The GMC, we said in 2019 it would register medical associate professionals, and they're probably going to probably next year. It's, it's been bumped on a little bit. There are two higher education institutes, HEIs, UCL, you'll be familiar with if you work here, and Birmingham, who are currently training, giving master's programs for anaesthesia associates. And there'll be three new ones, hopefully starting this year. And I'll tell you why there are three new ones in a minute. If you ask Paul Forsyth, the fantastic president of the Association of Anesthesia Associates, he will say in his wonderful Scouse dialect, which I won't attempt to copy, and I said, how many anesthesia associates are there in the UK, Paul? He said, I don't know. It's not a registered profession. We, we haven't a clue. I said, well, roughly. I said, about 200. So in 20 years, since we first thought of them, there are 200. This is not going to explode suddenly, guys. This is going to be a slow burn. Even if we get these f now five HEIs producing anaesthesia associates, by 2025, we'll only be producing 120 a year. This is not going to overwhelm the profession of anaesthesia. This is going to support the growth in consultant and SAS doctors. Where are they? Not my slide, a little bit messy, but you can see the red blobs of those people who responded to a survey, and they're pretty much scattered throughout the UK and one's gone to America. Um, so there's lots of money being put into anaesthesia associates. So the Health Education England, to each of those three new HEIs, is giving £100,000 each to develop a training program for anaesthesia associates. HEE will give anaesthesia associates £6,500 a year towards their master's course. It'll give the hospital up to £15,000 a year to provide a consultant anaesthetist to supervise second and third year anaesthesia associates. It will give the trust money to employ that student anaesthesia associate for their first year and half for their second year. And it has given the college a six-figure sum to help develop the uh, anaesthesia associate program and the mechanisms of being involved with anaesthesia associates. So here goes. We are supporting the development of anaesthesia associates as a key member of the anaesthetic workforce and we know that does not please all of our members. We are well aware of that. We're developing a curriculum, we're developing a faculty of anaesthesia associates, we're developing an exam, we're developing a diploma. This is the curriculum and if you want to know what that is, that's just written there. It's identifying the purpose, content of learning, process of training, program of assessment, leading to an anaesthesia associate qualification. I won't go through all these, but it's broken down into two bits, special specialty specific domains, but the first general professional capabilities. These will be fantastically familiar to you because it's just basically a rewrite from what a doctor does, not unreasonably. The specialty specific domains are as follows, and amongst that list of very reasonable things, and I didn't put post-operative medicine first because I knew I was coming here. It comes top anyway in the curriculum. So there, you can see Grocar almost breaking out into a smile there. Sedation and transfer is in there. Those things where they could be really put to some good use and other areas are all in there. We, we have already two faculties, a faculty of intensive care medicine and a faculty of pain medicine. And we propose the creation of a FARCA, a faculty of anaesthesia associates at the Royal College of Anaesthetists, for which we will need to go out to our membership in a general meeting and seek a two thirds vote of all members present physically or online to support the creation of a faculty. And we understand this will be no mean task. We, we, we don't underestimate the potential difficulty in not having a group of people saying they don't like this and stopping us doing it. So we are launching a campaign of communications to try and persuade those of our members who may not agree with us that it will be wise to participate in this new program, that they should vote for the creation of a faculty. Uh, we're creating an exam is called ARA, Anesthesia Associate Registration Assessment, and basically you'll sit it after your Higher Education Institute Masters, and it will allow you access to the GMC register. It'll have a written test of knowledge, and then it'll have a clinical part, which was going to be an SOE, but now may be a workplace-based assessment. I can wax lyrical on that afterwards. Um, and then you get on the register. 
a diploma. So the idea is that the other, the other three bits of the college, you get a fellowship of the Royal College of Nieces, a fellowship of the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine, faculty of the Faculty of Pain Medicine. You'll be a member of the Faculty of Anesthesia Associates because the qualification, we don't think, is as high as a fellowship, so it's called a membership. The issues we've got at the moment, prescribing rights, supervision, scope of practice, impact on training, and what's in a name. Um, it's a very complex issue, which is my way of saying I don't really understand it either. But what I do know is that as an anaesthetist, prescription is subconscious. I go to the cupboard, I take out an ampoule of glycopyronium, I draw up three mils, I give a mil, and I enter it on the chart. And I, I prescribe, without knowing it, I've actually prescribed something because that's what we do. But AAs cannot, most AAs cannot independently prescribe unless they have brought with them prescribing rights from a former life as a healthcare professional of another sort. Which means they have to rely on the anaesthetist, as most of you well know, to prescribe for that patient or that group of patients. And if there's drugs outside of those groups of drugs that the anaesthetist sign off, they have to go back to the anaesthetist. And it's very labour intensive and it's very boring and neither of them really want to do it, but you've got to do it. Should they have full access to the British National Formula is a question that we have been agonising about. But we have decided that this is we in this context is the Royal College of Anaesthetists to support the Association of Anaesthesia Associates in requesting full BNF access. We can talk about that afterwards, but we are supporting that to make their life a lot easier. The supervision grades up there are copied from the FRCA curriculum 2021 and are simple and are thus. Level one, you've got the consultant anaesthetist breathing down your neck. Level two, they're in the theatre suite available in seconds, but are locked in the theatre suite. Level three, they're in their office somewhere in another part of the hospital. Uh, so to be level, level three, they're at home and level four, shut up and get on with it yourself. There is a lot of hot debate about where we should draw the line for anaesthesia associates. I'm suggesting it goes down such that you will never have an anaesthesia associate giving an anaesthetic in a hospital without the physical presence of a consultant anaesthetist or other SAS or specialist grades licensed and signed off to supervise. But many of my colleagues think that it should go there, which means that the anaesthesia associates forever will only be able to function with their supervising consultant or other doctor in the operating theatre. Again, something we can discuss. There are lots of shades of grey tucked away within that. This is a six-year-old document setting out what anaesthesia associates can and cannot do on qualification. And what they can and cannot do is as follows. The supervising consultant anaesthetist must be physically present, i.e. breathing down their neck, for induction of anaesthesia and for emergence from anaesthesia. Similarly, on, on qualification, they are not allowed to stick needles in people or go near small people. They're not allowed to do regional blocks, they're not allowed to do obstetrics, they're not allowed to do paediatrics. Again, not my slide, but this is percentage of respondents on the vertical axis going up to 80%. This left box says I work only within the RCOA scope of practice, and the big one in the middle says I work beyond the scope of practice. The substantial majority of anaesthesia associates in this country work beyond the scope of practice set for anaesthesia associates on qualification, either by usually supervising emergence without the physical presence of a consultant or by doing blocks. Don't look at too much detail, just understand that anaesthesia associates throughout the country are doing spinals, epidurals, upper and lower limb nerve blocks, trunk blocks and eye blocks. A lot of them are doing that. Is that acceptable? Well, my view is I see no reason to limit the scope of practice of an anaesthesia associate by setting up a false line in the sand, which is regional anaesthesia or obstetric anaesthesia or paediatric anaesthesia or cardiac anaesthesia. It's much more about knowledge, skills and experience. And I think that undoubtedly these people, anaesthesia associates, will be able to contribute to practice within subspecialist areas by doing the more straightforward thing. Anybody can put in an epidural. If an obstetric anaesthetist can do it, anybody can. No shouldn't say that. It's simple. On a, on a straightforward slim woman, primip, first baby, not moving around too much, it's easy to train somebody to do that. And the really busy units, why not have people who do that straightforward things? Don't just set up the barrier and saying that you can't do it when they can do it and when they may be able to help out doing it. And it's all about the degree of supervision within that speciality. And be obviously, the more complex the speciality, the higher risk the speciality, the more supervision there'll be. 
Impact on training worries the hell out of trainees. All I will say is it's a considerable cause for concern. It seems to be less of a cause for concern in those departments that actually have anaesthesia associates and have had an experience of anaesthesia associates. We now have some public in, published information. If you do not regularly get the International Journal of Health Planning and Management, shame on you. You won't have seen this paper written by some names that may be very familiar to some of you, Nigel Penfold, Claudia Sellers. And they said this, robust data examining the impact on patients, hospitals or medical, or medical nieces is lacking. Data are lacking, really, but you get the point. The experience of working alongside Anesthesia Association in 2017, when they did a series of surveys, was incredibly positive. And although you may not be able to see that, they are saying that the overall experience of both college tutors and trainees in departments with established anaesthesia associates was that there was no detriment training opportunities and there were examples where the AAs actually enhanced training. There's a great case going on there in the corridor. Let me watch your straightforward case so you can go watch what's happening with a consultant. That sort of thing was happening on an almost daily basis. It was a positive experience. So trainees need to know everything that an anaesthesia associate knows they need to get used to doing the high volume low complexity work there is not a shortage of that at all that's not going to be a problem and i will stand up and say that now that for the more complex work they should have priority getting experience on the more complex work over the anaesthesia associates what's in a name well they were anaesthetic practitioners uh, they became physician's assistant in anaesthesia now they're anaesthesia associates, and there's one who has been recorded as saying, hello, I'm your anaesthetist. Oh, I can see the faces through the room. Think that's, think that's right? Should they be able to say they're an anaesthetist? There's a government list, and the link's at the bottom, you won't be able to see it, of what are called protected titles. These are titles protected in law. Some of the titles are up there. Physician, protected. Can't call yourself a physician, unless you're a physician. Surgeon, vet, optician, pharmacist. And... The Health and Care Professions Council can protect titles. It has the right to do it. You can't see all those, but dietitian, spelt with both a C and a T, are both protected titles, as are prosthetist. Somebody who looks at a prosthetist. There's lots of protected titles, but there are some unprotected titles. One of the unprotected titles is professor. Anybody can call themselves a professor, and anybody who really does seem to call themselves a professor as well. Sorry, anaesthetist colleagues, anaesthetist isn't a protected title. It's not a protected title. And if you look at the dictionaries, they're split half and half. Half of them say a medical specialist who administers anaesthetics, and the other half say a doctor trained to give anaesthetics. So that AA who says they're anaesthetist, it's actually correct. They're a medical specialist who gives anaesthetics. Get over it, guys. Just get over it. Or rekindle this debate. Are we anaesthetists? Are we anesthesiologists? This is the this is the coat of arms of the College of Anesthet no, the College of Anesthesiologists of Ireland, because they recently had this debate and they changed. And we should I'm not I'm not saying we go for it, but if we're worried about other people calling themselves anaesthetists, we're gonna have to call them something else. Call ourselves something else. Or are we? Very briefly, this is a well-recognized document. Good medical practice says what doctors should do. It's being rewritten. It's out for consultation because they can't say just doctors anymore because they're going to regulate medical associate professions as well. And the new version says this, behaviors of medical professionals registered with the GMC. Make the case. I don't like that because medical professionals is everybody who gets paid to work in medicine. And I don't know why they haven't said doctors and MAPs. So a lot of this nomenclature is going to get a very grey and contentious area in the next few years. Very briefly, two minutes. Can we learn anything from the USA? Yes, we can learn how not to do it. No? Just saying that. Okay, the history is long, and I won't bore you with all the history, but the nub of it was anaesthesia was first given, general anaesthesia, a successful demonstration in the ether dome in 1846 by a dentist. And he said, it's wonderful, it's marvellous. And all the doctors said... It's beneath us, and it is not good for our status or pay. We're not going to do it. And the nurses said, fine, we'll do it. So most of the earlier anesthesia providers in the US were nurse anesthetists. It's only later that the anesthesiologists said, we'd like to move in here. And what has happened as a result, in most states of the USA, there is nothing that a nurse anesthetist cannot do 
which an anesthesiologist can do. They are largely equivalent in what they are allowed to do. And in many states in the USA, a nurse anesthetist does not have to be supervised in any way, shape or form. They used to be, so at the very early days, there were more nurse anesthetists and anesthesiologists. Over the last 150 years, the number of anesthesiologists has grown. But now the nurse anesthesiologists have not just caught up, they've overtaken them. In the USA, there are 31,000 anesthesiologists earning an average of $330,000. Nice work if you can get it. But there are more. There are 44,000 nurse anesthetists at an e mean income of $200,000, which is also nice work if you can get it. Okay, so the ASA, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, and the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists are at each other's bloody throats. They hate each other absolutely with a livid, raw hatred. So the AS has a campaign saying, if, you, if you, I'm going to do an American accent for which I humbly apologize, it is awful. And if there's anybody American in the audience, can I apologize straight away? You should, I'm not going to try to get out. You should ask your, your, your anesthesia provider whether they are a doctor. Ask them. So what happened? The CRNA qualification becomes a doctorate degree. So the nurse anesthetist can say, I'm a doctor, which they are. Well, that's okay. So the ASA said, look, ask your anesthesia provider whether they are an anesthesiologist. So what does the ANA do? It changes its name from the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists to the American Association of Nurse Anesthesiology, which allows them to say, I am your nurse anesthesiologist, or I am your anesthesiologist. They're at each other's throats. Did the ASA condemn the name change? Did they hell con to condemn the name change? They were furious, as was the American Medical Association was well cross as well. And they have, the ASA has campaigns made for this moment, moments that matter most. The latest one is when seconds count. And you can see there, when seconds count, physician anesthesiologists save lives. The assumption is that nurse anesthetists don't. Hunter, uh, Hunter is apparently a woman's name in America. I, I have no idea. It's the name of Wellington Boot in this country. So I... Hunter's physician anesthesiologist called off her surgery and prevented potential paralysis. Understanding a nurse anesthetist would be able to oh, get over it, work together. The key question really is, which group is safer? A nurse anesthetist or anesthesiologist? And the key answer, which I'll whip through very quickly because I'm enjoying myself so much I'm running out of time. There are lots of publications, but there's no bloody evidence at all. Really no evidence. The research is flawed. There are methodological issues. Don't look at the details. This is the ASA looking at seven, pa seven papers, looking at green papers of the green edge that are really good because they show that anesthesiologists are better and red papers, which are really bad because they show that there's no difference between nurse anesthetists and anesthesiologists. Wherever there is confusion, you introduce the Cochrane collaboration in order not to get rid of the confusion at all, because they never say anything to, to, to definitive. And they published a, an assessment of physician anesthetists versus non-physician providers for anesthesia for surgical patients, a review. And the question, the key question was, are non-physician anesthetists able to provide equivalent anesthetic services to medically qualified anesthesia providers? And the answer is as follows. Uh, you can't say anything at all. No definitive. Every bloody Cochrane review I read said that there is no definitive statement can be made about the possible superiority of one type of anesthesia care lower because it's, it's just too complex. It's just just too difficult, and they're not doing randomised controlled studies. The responses were interesting. What do you think the, the American Association of Nurse Anesthesiologists said about that? They said researchers find no differences in care provided by CRNA. That's not what they found. They said there's no information to inform the answer. And the ASA had to come back and say, that's not what they said actually. What they said was, and they said that. that they're just at each other's throats. The best paper was actually written by nurses. And they concluded as follows. Evidence-based guidance on the competing anesthesia practice models is likely to remain politicized. Hell yes. And it will remain politicized. OK, final conclusions. We must work together as members of the same team. We must, I think, accept and embrace the concept and the growth of anaesthesia associates within the, within the workforce. If for no other reason than the consequences for our patients, for us and for anaesthesia associates, would be bad, just bad. There are lots of other good reasons to do it, but that, I think, is the most, is this most cogent reason. I support the college doing what it's doing, and I know that not all anaesthetists agree with me. 
wonderful article written by my father-in-law in World Medicine, which was the private eye. Come, come up and, and pace up and down, Mike. Uh, said, need surgeons be medically qualified? Um, there was an outrage, mainly from surgeons. But what he was really asking is, if your practice in medicine is defined solely by procedures, your days are numbered because other people will come and do those procedures. So what is the difference between a doctor, an anesthetist, and an anesthesia associates? There are lots of things that define doctors. In this context, I've defined them as somebody who deals with uncertainty and takes decisions in the face of that uncertainty in the patient's best interest based on knowledge, skills, and experience, who manages complexity of surgery, anesthesia, and patient comorbidities, who has the knowledge, experience, and confidence to deviate from guidelines. I want my anesthesia associate to follow guidelines, and if they don't want to, to come to me first. I think it's a doctor's job to be able to say when we deviate from guidelines. And of course, the SAS. Not SAS doctors, but the real SAS. This was a conversation between a real SAS person and a consultant anesthetist. And the SAS person said this, we don't get paid for what we do. You're just like me, you consultant anesthetists and SAS soldiers. You don't get paid for what you do. You get paid for what we might have to do, all right? And it's still worth paying somebody a lot, a lot of money to be available to supervise, to step in, react quickly with a breadth of knowledge and experience and save patients with the anesthesia associate. Enough rambling, loads of other things I won't go through them that I haven't covered. I'm happy in the last three and a half seconds I've left at the end of this talk to answer some questions I or just to listen to you making comments. Um, Final, me final message, nobody in their right mind would design a healthcare system in which the most straightforward work in a speciality is done by the best paid people. Just, just hold that, shout at me if you want, but hold that message in, in your mind that we must change our view of consultants, what consultants do in some respects if we, if we want to continue to have a varied and interesting workload and continue to get rewarded well. We must commit ourselves to maintain the highest standards. We must continue ourselves to make the role of AA interesting with progression and variation and valuable. We must protect trainees. We must be part of that change by being a member of the anaesthetic team and by as consultants and senior SAS doctors actually leading the anaesthetic team with anaesthesia associates in. And at last, I will shut up and as much time as you can allow, Mike, I will take questions. Thank you very much. Top Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organising around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own Home. Check out ebpom.org now.